Mr. Birdus is a 40 year old uh, bird watching society. And uh, since 40 years, it is going great guns. Our membership base is 450 and counting. And uh, we have a lot of activities, like every two Sundays in a month, we take uh, people birding, our members and non-members, etc. We notice that there is a lot of excitement now. People want to go out. A very interesting thing is kids are coming for bird watching. So that's very exciting news for us because catch them young. So when they know about nature and its creatures, they know how to safeguard it. So that is one exciting news for us. And then uh, we have uh, every two Sundays in a month, uh, um, bird watching trips. We go to Pocharam, Shamarpet, and um, so many places around Anantagiri Hills and all uh, around uh, Hyderabad. We go, not only that, we go, we go outstation trips also. We make, we have been to Goa, Assam, and Kerala, where you can do fantastic birding. That, that doesn't mean Telangana doesn't have birds. Telangana has also fantastic, uh, you know, uh, bird numbers. And Deccan Birders is also responsible for uh, Asian waterfowl census. Where we are the whole and soul society that does uh, in uh, December, January, and February, we count all the water birds around the lakes of uh, Telangana. And then we send it to the Wetland International in uh, Netherlands where they pull the data scientifically and then, then give us feedback as to the lake health and the number of migratory species that are coming in, whether the number is decreasing or increasing, so that, you know, really e equips us with scientific data. So Deccan Birders is very proud to conduct the Asian Waterfowl Census uh, every year. So our members are responsible for it. And then uh, we have every, every month, we have uh, something called uh, indoor talks where we use the premises of German center. As you all know, Goethe Zentru in uh, Banjara Hills. We use the premises. They are our partner also. And uh, we invite speakers. We invite speakers like Deepan Vita. We invite speakers like Dr. Y.G. Prasad Garu. And so many umpteen number of speakers have come. Fantastic speakers have come and talked on varied subjects. Uh, anything to do with nature, under the umbrella of nature. It could be a pygmy hog, it could be locust, and it could be snakes, and so many varied things, which is very popular, and it, it is conducted in German center. So now uh, that is about us. So I'm very happy this evening to invite one of our life members and a very avid birder, um, Dr. Deepan Vita Purohit. And uh, she's right here. She's going to talk to us about the pygmy hog. The pygmy hog is the smallest and the rarest pig in the world. So she's going to give us um, an insight into its biology and conservation. A little about Deepan Vita, because she's very self-effacing, I would like to say all this on her behalf. Deepan Vita Purohit studies uh, genetics of the critically endangered pig species, pygmy hog, for its better population management. She holds a PhD from Madras University. Yay! And then she's a plant biotechnologist by training and who changed her course into conservation biology upon joining the laboratory for conservation of endangered species, that is Lacons. Lacons is also a great friend. They often come birding and they all uh, come for the indoor talks also. A lot of uh, Lacons, uh, which is under the CCMB, have come and uh, talked to us also in Deccan Birders. So she's right, right now pursuing postdoctoral studies in Lacons. So now I give you the stage, Deepa. Thanks for coming to Deccan Birders, the Pygmy Hog, all yours. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, should I share the screen now and start sharing the screen? Yeah. So, good evening all. And I thank uh, Deccan Border for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, Pygmy Hog. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, switch off the video. Yeah. So, Pygmy Hog as the cannot scroll. Wait. 
minutes. I cannot spoil the video. Yeah, uh, so uh, pygmy hog, as the name uh, suggests, it's the smallest uh, species of uh, pig. It's a wild pig and uh, also rarest, rarest because only few hundreds of uh, this individuals are there in uh, its uh, natural habitat. Like some uh, 150 to 200 individuals are there in uh, uh, grassland habitat in uh, Northwest Assam in Manas National Park. And as you can see in this picture, this is a this is a male pygmy hog and this is a female pygmy hog. Why I'm not able to I'm not able to yeah. So this is uh, yeah. I'm not able to help you scroll my PPT slides. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or else try uh, uh, exiting. Yeah, now it is fine. Okay. Use your arrow also. Yeah. Yeah, now it is fine. Okay. So as you can see, uh, this is uh, this is male and this is female. So the, uh, this male and female pygmy hog they look alike, uh, except for this male pygmy hog they have uh, uh, they have sharp uh, tusk and a very prominent moustache above its uh, snout. And this pygmy hog, its closest relative is wild boar. Uh, you must have seen wild boar. So, how uh, how this pygmy hog is different from wild boar? It's mainly it's the size. So, this is a uh, schematic diagram uh, drawn by William Oliver. He is a uh, uh, British conservationist uh, uh, of wild pig. So, here you can see the size difference between. Uh, adult pygmy hog and wild boar. So, uh, a adult pygmy hog it weigh around eight to nine kg. And uh, uh, apart from size, uh, size the uh, other distinguishing uh, factor is their tail. Pygmy hog has very small vestigial tail, whereas I wild boar tail is uh, well, like it's visible properly. And also, a pygmy hog has three pairs of uh, mammary glands. Whereas a wild boar, it has five to six pairs of uh, memory glands. This is a wild boar in uh, Manas National Park, which is near pygmy hog habitat. And uh, pygmy hog is unique. Uh, pygmy hog species is uh, unique in so many other aspects also. Like uh, it, it, it builds its own nest, unlike other members of the Swede family. Like uh, it builds a nest with uh, grass, uh, mud. And uh, it builds a dome shaped nest and it is highly camouflaged on the ground. It take rest in the nest. And it is a group living species, so uh, they live in a group of five to six. So they, so this is this nest is built by a pygmy hog in a span of just one to two hours, they build nest. And most of the time, they spend time there, they are not foraging. And coming to their feeding habits, they are omnivores, uh, like they feed on uh, tubers, uh, wild fruit, they, uh, eggs, then uh, small invertebrates, like these are other things which are available in the grassland. So they feed on these uh, uh, things. And another interesting feature about pygmy hog is, this is the host, uh, this pygmy hog is the sole host for a, uh, Louse called pygmy hog sucking louse. It is a highly specialized louse called Hematopenus oliveri. This is also more. This louse is uh, found only in pygmy hog and not even its uh, closest relative wild boar. And this louse is now critically endangered because of uh, the precarious status of its host. Like uh, pygmy hog is also critically endangered, so that is why this louse is also now uh, critically endangered. And coming to its breeding, they breed uh, once uh, in a year, uh, just before uh, rainy season starts, they uh, breed like uh, from uh, April to June, and uh, they produce a litter size uh, of uh, three to six individuals. And a newborn pygmy hog will just weigh around uh, 150 gram. You can very well hold it in your palm, 
and they like they come out of the nest uh, seven days after birth and they will be they attain sexual maturity uh, at uh, 11 or 12 months so till then they spend most of the time with their uh, mother now coming to the geographical range so uh, i told before mihog its uh, geographical range is uh, the bhavatrai grassland this uh, bhavatrai grassland is a narrow wet alluvial grassland it is extend uh, it like its range is from uh, northwest uttarakhand to uh, assam and uh, it's in the south himalayan foothill and uh, previously this grassland was continuous in the entire uh, south himalayan foothill but now uh, it is highly fragmented and this grassland is now mostly replaced by, uh, by human encroachment and uh, agriculture and these grasslands are now mostly restricted to the um, protected areas and the reduce uh, reduction in this grassland habitat is very evident from the decrease in population of so many grassland obligate species like uh, pygmy hawk and the one horn rhinoceros then the hispid hare bengal floribund these are all grassland obligate species like for their survival they need grasslands and uh, these grasslands are like 90% of the original grasslands are now have disappeared and mostly it is restricted to the protected areas and uh, by behavior pygmy hawk is very shy and it's very elusive so it is very difficult to uh, spot a pygmy hawk in the wild uh, like see a pygmy hawk in the wild but previously it is it has been sighted in nepal uh, and uh, north uh, north bengal and in uttarakhand uttar pradesh even in bangladesh it was sighted but now it has been locally extinct from all these regions so at present it is found only in manas national park that is in the northwest uh, assam and uh, also it is uh, ex its uh, presence is uncertain in bhutan because this manas national park is conti uh, contiguous with the royal manas national park in the bhutan side and in bhutan also there are some suitable grassland habitat is still present undisturbed grassland habitat so it is believed that uh, pygmy hawk is found there but however it's uh, uh, it's not uh, sighted yet so this is actually the past and the present uh, distribution of uh, pygmy hawk so this light green area it was believed to be present there before but now it is all locally extinct and there are uh, some reintroduction site also like there are few national park where uh, the captive bred pygmy hawks have been reintroduced so there are some reintroduced population also thriving in some other uh, national park but mostly the wild population is now restricted to manas national park so this is the google earth image of uh, manas national park so as you can see it is uh, this uh, this park is traversed with so many major and minor rivers so this is uh, one of the major river is beki river and this is uh, manas river these are the major tributaries of uh, brahmaputra located in the south of manas national park and apart from that there are several minor rivers also and uh, this is uh, the uh, white outline uh, white demarcation line is the indian border and the other side is the royal Na uh, manas national park on the bhutan side and the area the light green area are the grasslands and the dark green area are the woodlands so these grasslands are mostly uh, they are formed by the alluvium deposit by the changing water course of these uh, rivers and these grasses are mostly this uh, they are uh, uh, like early colonizing grasses they are mostly dominated by uh, saccharum species saccharum then uh, Imperta cylindrica, Thamda velosa. These are just some very prominent, dominant grasses found in these grasslands. And uh, these grasslands are uh, like, uh, yeah. And uh, Yeah. So and as you so as you move towards Bhutan, 
there will be elevation uh, uh, like there will be change in uh, vegetation from grassland to uh, early river and dry deciduous forest to the salt forest mostly and this uh, grasses are uh, so this is the grass uh, this is how the grassland of manas looks like and uh, you can see a wild buffalo in the grassland and this grassland in its uh, pristine form it is also intermixed with so many other um, fast growing herbs and uh, some early colonizing shrubs and young trees as you can see here so why this uh, grasslands are disappearing because uh, why this pygmy hog as well as this grassland they are uh, disappearing because these grasses are of high commercial importance this grass uh, this grasses are also called thatch grass and it has high commercial values so it has been uh, harvested uh, annually or biannually and uh, usually uh, this grass in uh, its uh, like its uh, tender grass are more preferred so that is why to facilitate uh, to facilitate early growth of grass they usually burn the grass every february or the start of the dry season they burn it to facilitate uh, new growth of grass so in that uh, usually ecologists they suggest that this grassland should be burned once in every 2 3 years and it should be burned in alternate blocks but that is not being followed and uh, they burn it every year so because of that it is uh, very adversely it is the soil this pygmy hog is uh, dependent on the many invertebrate and so many eggs uh, found on the soil so those things those uh, food sources are now limiting and uh, because of that uh, also it is affecting the survival of pygmy hog and not only pygmy hog there are so many other small mammals like bengal florican and cispid hare they are survival also uh, under threat because of this uh, rampant burning of grassland and also the other thing is as i showed in this graph so this are see the this grassland is now continuous only Only in the Manas area, but once upon a time, few years back, 20-30 years back, the entire area was fully covered with grassland. But now it is all fragmented. Now there are new cities and small towns are coming up in this area, and uh, there are tree plantation also, uh, tea plantation. So because of this, this grassland has become highly fragmented. And due to with agriculture and with human adaptation they have also because of that they have introduced so many invasive species in the grassland so that has also contributed to the degradation of grassland one dominant invasive species is chromolina odorata so this species is like rapidly growing there and it is suppressing the growth of so many native species native grass species like as you can see from here like this is the grass one patch of grassland and it is so many other invasive species are there apart from that due to improper uh, unscientific management of uh, like unscientific management of forestry so they are planting woody trees uh, like this is bombax seba that it has a very high dispersal rate so that also earlier there are very few of these in the grassland patches but now the whole grassland patches are now uh, have so many trees uh, of this kind so that is also with this tree around it is not allowing the growth of uh, the native grasses so that way also the grassland uh, the grass species are affected and as i said this is annual grass burning so it starts in the month of february in early february they uh, burn the grass so one they usually do it in alternate patches like one patch they grow, they burn and then after they give 15 days time and after 15 days they go to 
they ship to the next uh, adjacent block. So likewise, they uh, burn the entire grass. But this grass is, it is this grass is, has high regenerative uh, uh, ability, and within uh, so this is just 15 days after post burning, new grasses have regenerated. And these are some species which I saw in my last visit to Manas. Like uh, you can see, uh, if you visit Manas, you can see uh, elephants, rhinos, wild buffalo, and uh, of deer. I also saw this greater adjutant. That is also a very grassland species. Uh, and uh, this greater adjutant, uh, their population is there in Assam, and a small population is there in uh, Manas also. So now coming to its uh, conservation. So since only very few of uh, the Indian only some hundreds or one fifty individuals are left. So in uh, 95, 96, uh, they, uh, an initiative was started to uh, conserve this Kimi uh, uh, from extinction. So Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust, along with uh, uh, the uh, Forest Department of Assam and Ministry of Forest and environment the government of India. They started a uh, program called Pygmy Hawk Conservation Breeding Program. And uh, their main objective was to, the main, they had two, three goals, but the first immediate goal was to increase the number of Pygmy Hawk. Because in the wild, only 150 or 200 individuals were there. So if there is some, uh, suddenly if there is some uh, catastrophe or something happens, then there was high possibility that the entire population were, uh, is uh, wiped out the possibility of entire population getting wiped out was very high. So their immediate uh, concern was to increase the population of pygmy hawk by captive breeding. And apart from that, uh, there uh, another underlying theme of uh, pygmy hawk uh, captive breeding program was to uh, manage the grassland as per pygmy hawk requirements. Like, uh, uh, why pygmy hog requirement? Because pygmy hog is also considered as an uh, indicator species. Since it is highly specialized, uh, if there is a, uh, like some disturbance to grassland, then pygmy hog won't be able to survive. So if they able to survive properly, that means the grassland is in its uh, healthy form. And that way it will help other species to, uh, who are living in the same habitat, like uh, uh, as I mentioned before, Bengal Florican, rhinos, speed hare, and so many other species. The speed hare, Bengal Florican, they are also critically endangered. So, with this, uh, they started this uh, uh, breeding program uh, with six individuals. So, they caught uh, six uh, pygmy hawk from uh, Manas, two, fem two male and four female, and this is the captive breeding facility. Uh, located in uh, Basista, that is present in the outskirts of uh, Guwahati in uh, Assam. And this pygmy hawk program is uh, there, uh, it is uh, highly successful. So, as you can see, they have so many enclosures. So, in these enclosures, these are the breeding enclosures. So, like this, they have some 16 breeding enclosures. And in each enclosure, they have planted uh, elephant grass and uh, other grasses which are uh, found in uh, its natural wild habitat. So what they do is they, uh, they select mate, like they have uh, from these six individuals, uh, this program has been highly successful and by within a span of some five to six, uh, six years, they could uh, manage to uh, produce some more than 12 times the original population of pygmy hawk. So, uh, some 70 or 80 individuals they could uh, able to breed in a span of five to six years. And since 2008, they have started releasing pygmy hog into the wild. Uh, so, usually what they do, they, uh, uh, they, they maintain a pedigree, they maintain a book, online start book where they will have the pedigree information of all the pygmy hog. So based on this pedigree data, they based on this pedigree data, they determine their kinship and make suitability index. They also observe the behavior of pygmy hog in this breeding enclosure. 
like uh, what they usually do they uh, they keep uh, the uh, they keep young individuals from different mother in the same enclosure and they see how they are interacting and based on their behavior they pair the individuals for uh, breeding and also here they uh, they, breed, they feed the individuals four times a day with very high quality food supplements. So, uh, in CCMA, our work uh, mainly, uh, so as I told before, they pair the, uh, pair the individuals based on the pedigree data. So, here in CCMB, what we are uh, doing is we are testing their, we are testing their genetic diversity because this pygmy hog is already uh, only very few individuals are there, so their genetic pool is highly limited. So it is very highly essential that there should not be any further loss in their genetic pool. So what we do using molecular marker, we test the genetic diversity of the pygmy hog, and using that information, we estimate the genetic relatedness between individuals, and Based on the genetic distance between different individuals, we recommend uh, like these such and such individuals can be paired for uh, future breeding. So with that approach, uh, with that approach, the further loss, further genetic loss can be minimized, and uh, in that way also can avoid inbreeding because these individuals are all uh, actually this. Uh, Captive breeding program is started with six individuals, and in 2011, they again enriched the breeding stock with uh, some more wild caught individuals. So, their uh, so it is uh, so their genetic pool is highly limited. So we don't want to uh, so to avoid inbreeding, we have to we have to pair these individuals in such a way that the genetic variability will be maintained, and that way they are uh, they will have maximized effective population size. So in CCMB, we mostly do the genetic testing and we recommend mate uh, for further breeding. Then these individuals uh, at the captive breeding center, after uh, like they spend some one year or two years in uh, uh, the breeding site and before release into the wild, they were brought to the pre-release site, which is present in the Potasvali Nameri. That is, uh, that is also a tiger reserve and uh, this uh, here the release enclosure this pre-release and here the enclosure are big like uh, some three to four square kilometer and this enclosure have like semi wild condition so in this in this enclosure this pygmy house they spend some uh, six months to one year and they are taught in, in this duration they learn to live in the wild without uh, very much, uh, they learn to forage in the wild and without very much dependent on the food supplement provided by the captive breeding center. So each uh, pre-release enclosure, it has, uh, each pre-release enclosure has uh, like, uh, it's uh, since it's uh, three to four square kilometer in size, so it has the ability to meet the food requirement of five to six uh, hog, pygmy hog. So the hogs are earmarked for reintroduction and reared in the pre-release site for uh, uh, some six to one months, six to one year, and then they are uh, taken for release into the wild. So actually, in, uh, in the pre-release site, there was a, uh, uh, like uh, we could see cat langur. Cat langur is also Actually, its population is decreasing, and it's uh, uh, like it's found in the northeast region of India. So I saw uh, like uh, a very large troop of cat langur in uh, Nameri. So this is a pre-release enclosure at Potasal uh, in Nameri. So up, uh, and this is the release enclosure at Uran. So after after pre-release. Uh, after spending one year, they release into the wild. So for uh, release into the wild, this Pygmy Hawk Center, they do the um, proper field survey to search like whatever protected areas are there with grassland. 
they search for those areas and they found uh, a few sites in Oral and in Sonairupai National Park where the grassland patches are similar to what National Park. So they release, uh, they bring this uh, individual uh, to Orang and there they release. So this is a grassland patch in Orang. Uh, it was in February. Actually, that time it was highly, it was very foggy, so I couldn't get good picture. And there also uh, in February, the burning session, grass burning session was going on. So this is another patch with, uh, uh, which is already burned. So after release, they do the post-release monitoring. Like uh, they have to after the pygmy hawks are uh, released into the wild, we have to they have to ensure that uh, they are able to survive successfully in the wild. So they mostly they do it with uh, indirect methods because pygmy hawk is uh, highly elusive and their habitat is like this uh, grassland. They are this uh, grasses are one to four meter tall and they are very dense grass. So it is very difficult to sight the pygmy hog in the wild. So they do indirect uh, field signs on way, like they look for foraging marks, footprints, nest and droppings. So after the grasses are born in uh, January and February, uh, they, they burn the grasses in alternate patches. So one patch is born, so they ship to the, uh, so the pygmy hogs in that patch, they, they run to, or they ship to, uh, they move to the adjacent patch. So in that patch, they look for any foraging marks or nest. If nest or droppings are there, then from that indirect sign only, they come to know, okay, this area was occupied by pygmy hog. So that is how they do the post release monitoring. They also have installed some camera traps at few bait station. And they have found that, uh, like, uh, they have found, uh, last year they found some, uh, Captive rear pygmy hog, they were able to reproduce and they found few new babies in the wild uh, through camera trap. They captured the picture of new babies in the wild, which are born to uh, captive, uh, captive rear pygmy hog. So from that, uh, uh, so from that they came to know that it is able to establish itself successfully in the wild. And so far they have released in uh, Sonai Rupai and in uh, Orang. And the release introduced population in Orang is especially very successful. It has uh, able to uh, like it has able to expand its range also. Like uh, they have uh, sighted pygmy hog in some uh, outside Orang uh, grassland range also. And this year, uh, so every year they release some uh, thirteen to fourteen pygmy hog. And usually they don't release pygmy hog in the in Manas because Manas is the wild population and they didn't want to mix uh, uh, wild population with the captive bred population. But this year they released in Buyambera range in uh, Manas, which is in the west, uh, so east of Manas National Park. And that area is uh, in that area pygmy hog is not found. So that is why they introduced pygmy hog there this year. And since uh, since 2008, so far they have released some 130 pygmy hawks into the wild and uh, they are very successful and uh, because of uh, the effort by this captive breeding center, this uh, pygmy hawk population has increased quite considerably and also their range has also expanded and due to this IUCN last year have uh, upgraded the status of pygmy hawk from critically endangered to endangered. So earlier it was critically endangered, now since 2019, now it is considered as endangered. And um, apart from that, uh, this is, uh, and also this pygmy hawk captive breeding center, they are also associated with, uh, uh, they also do this uh, field survey on regular basis to find more suitable habitats for pygmy hawks. So that, uh, other organisms or other species also will be equally benefited. Apart from that, they do awareness generation and capacity building program among local communities and frontline uh, protection staff uh, for proper conservation of pygmy hawk as well as the grassland. Uh, so that's it, actually. 
So now I'm open for question and such and so on. Yeah, hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, hi, uh, Dipanita. See, we have, uh, I think, uh, Sureka, are you coming in? Yeah, see, uh, meanwhile, we'll just take a few questions from uh, JVD uncle. See, he has already uh, written a few questions. Uh, how successful has been the captive breeding program? As I said, it's uh, highly successful. Like uh, uh, they could, uh, they started with only six individuals, and within a span of five to six years, they could reproduce seventy individuals. And now, uh, in the breeding center, they maintain some seventy piggy hogs. And apart from that, they release uh, some ten to fifteen hogs in the wild. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so that's that's more of a successful story of uh, captive breeding. Okay, yeah, and uh, yeah. yeah, and one more question: uh, Where does the uh, from Javedi Uncle? Where does the funding for this program come from? Is is the state government supporting the program? Uh, uh, mostly the funding, uh, yeah, government is also funding, and also this Durian Wildlife Conservation Trust. They are also one of the major funding organizations. Okay, okay, and one more question from Uncle Javadi Uncle. Uh, has any attempt been made to release them at other suitable habits? I think actually, I this doubt even I have. See, like, say, uh, we have a proposal of this Gujarat land from Gujarat to Madhya Pradesh. So, is there any mm -hmm. suitable position? Because you were talking about a wiping out of species uh, if there is some uh, catastrophic, uh, you know, event. So, is there any suitable uh, thing in India that you can look at? See, their habitat is grassland, so as I told before, like their wild population exists only in Manas. But now they are searching for other suitable habitat, like they have been introduced in Orang National Park, in Solairopai. These national parks are uh, at different locations actually. So there, uh, along with it, they are also looking for uh, other grassland sites, like in Dudua National Park. and. Uh, uh, Wherever the grassland uh, is, uh, wherever this grassland is present in the protected areas, they are, they are, uh, they are, they are mostly searching for the suitable habitat, and there is a plan to introduce the pygmy hawk there also. Like it is, it was found in uh, northern West Bengal in Uttar Pradesh. So those areas also they are searching for the suitable habitat, grassland habitat. Okay, uh, uh, can you just switch off the screen, uh, Deepanita? Stop sharing the screen. Your screen is still uh, on. Okay, stop. Yeah, 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 yeah cool. Uh, okay, uh, one mm -hmm. more question from Omesh Mani. Are pygmy hogs endemic to India? Yeah, yeah, it is endemic. Oh, they are endemic. Right now it is endemic to India. Earlier okay. it was found in Nepal and Bangladesh also. Okay. Like, Okay. Current population is now restricted to India. Earlier it was there in Nepal, Bangladesh. Okay. Bhutan also it might be present. Okay. Okay. Like, it has the not status been is not clear. Because, hmm. Yeah, its suitable habitat is there, so it is believed that uh, pygmy hawk might be present, but it has not been sighted there. Okay. Uh, okay. One more question from uh, Shravan. Shravan, you can just ask her directly. Uh, so, as a field biologist, I would like to know one thing uh, about about the wild pygmy hawks. How uh -huh. was the census carried out? You said uh, about only one uh, one thirty to one forty uh, individuals are left in the wild. So uh -huh. it it is as just as uh, as equal as the uh, uh, great Indian bustard. Yeah. So uh, as the the now uh, whole country is towards the like uh, the great Indian bustard had ga uh, grabbed uh, interest towards them. So, uh, how is this uh, census of these uh, species carried out? See, there is uh, since uh, it's because of its habitat type, it is not. Uh, it is very difficult to spot a pygmy hawk in the wild. 
So mostly through indirect method only they do. Like as I told before. Yeah, it is very cryptic and uh, it lives in the grassland habitat. So yeah. citing them will be very much difficult for uh, carrying so out. There is uh, no direct method of uh, sensors. Like they have not uh, done uh, through like through indirect field science survey only. They know that uh, the pygmy hog is present. This and they usually in the reintroduced site they know how many individuals they have uh, released into the in that particular area. So every six months or every since the grass burn is uh, grass burning session. Every year they do. So from that only they uh, they assume that one nest will be shared by some five to six individuals. So based on the number of nest, they get an approximate value. If this many individuals will be there, like uh, there is no direct uh, method okay. of uh, okay. Thank you. the number okay. exact number. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, it is dependent on uh, number of nests. Yeah, that is one method. Okay. okay. Thank you. And this uh, 150 to 200, that is also like an approximate number. Like it's an approximate figure. It's not the exact number. Okay. Because this uh, grassland, as you know, it is also being uh, inhabited by tigers and uh, leopards. So going there and uh, such, uh, doing the direct uh, counting is really difficult to camera trapping also. Uh, Sherwin, are you clear? Yeah, yeah, clear. Okay, yeah. Thank you. We have Thank uh, you. one more question from uh, OnePlus60. Is pygmy hog vulnerable to you know tribal hunters? Is there any participatory role of indigenous tribes? Yeah, it it used to be in the early 60s and 70s. Uh, it was uh, uh, its population reduced mainly because of this uh, for this hunting only bushmeat uh, hunting for the bushmeat. But now this area is well protected. This uh, Manas National Park is well protected. And the locals, there are also a lot of awareness program is going on. So they they also don't, uh, uh, like they are protective towards uh, this pygmy hog and they don't kill. Okay, so there, now, there's this, awareness now. Yeah, now it is well protected. There's no hunting. Okay. Uh, one more question from JVD uncle. Uh, any funding from abroad by any other organization or corporates? Yeah, there are, yeah, there are so many. From abroad, they get a lot of fundings. But exactly what the funding body, I don't have any much idea. But they get funds every year from different funding agencies. And one more question from Raghupati Garu. Uh, what are the predators for uh, pygmy hog? Tigers, leopards. Okay, okay. And I think, yes, yeah, Satvik has one more question. I think even Hyderabad Nehru Zoo is having this breeding center. So, how likely are these individuals bred in captive survival rate if we release them into wild? Uh, Hyderabad Zoo, they have the captive breeding center for uh, mouse deer, I guess. Not. Uh, they're doing uh, captive breeding of mouse deer, and I think they're releasing also in uh, Amrabad uh, Tiger Reserve every year. Uh, there are also lacons is uh, involved. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay, we have a question from MS Ram. Uh, we find several mutualistic associations of birds with mammals in the wild. In your experience, have you seen any birds associating with pygmy hogs? Uh, good question, MS Ram. No, I haven't seen actually. Okay. <laughs> but I have seen uh, greater vegetarians uh, sharing the same uh, habitat with pygmy hog, but I don't know what kind of uh, mutualistic relationship they have. Okay. Okay. Nice. Uh, I have uh, one more question for myself. Uh, see, you said that this, uh, you know, periodic burning of the grass. So let's say if it is in the Manas National Park where you are releasing, do they actually burn there in the national park? Uh, they are not supposed to burn, if I am not wrong. No, in the national park also they burn because there also they say these animals they prefer uh, the tender grass. So once this this grass actually they are very hard, very herbaceous actually. So they usually burn it to facilitate new growth. So this tender grass is usually mostly consumed by rhinos and other elephants. So that is why they 
actually mostly they do the grass uh, land uh, this burning this management of this grassland they mostly do for rhinos and uh, elephants and mm. in that process pigmy of gets benefit mm. okay okay uh, so any other yeah, question they, they burn it in alternate blocks actually so they at okay. a time the interest is they don't burn they burn it in uh, alternate blocks okay yeah sureka what is it diet consist of uh, the feed on tubers fruits uh, wild fruits and uh, some small invertebrates earthworm eggs omnivores they are omnivores oh omnivores okay and question from ms ram do they have any vocalizations yeah they have vocalization in the sense uh, like communication between uh, different individuals yes yes uh, uh, and yes and calls like i have not uh, observed anything of that sort but in captive breeding center i have seen like they while foraging they make some call but uh, again not any identified uh, yeah i don't know how it like it is for communicating with each other that i don't know like how it okay. is with the group behavior i don't know okay yeah mm, yeah one more question from one plus 60 uh, is it true that the pygmy hawk is a sole survivor of uh, portula genes genus yeah. sorry yeah. yeah yeah it's actually it belongs to a monotypic genus portula okay okay so it it has no uh, what do you say uh, cousins or relative cousins nothing like that earlier actually it was uh, uh, it belonged to the genus sus uh, where the wild boar is also there like uh, okay. but uh, they did uh, some genetic testing and uh, from that they arrived at that this the um, pygmy hawk is different from uh, sus genus so they put it in portula genus okay and question from venai uh, what is the life span Uh, in the captive breeding center they live for 14 years and in the wild it is believed that uh, it will be surviving for 7 years no record in the wild okay uh, but it is in captive breeding is 14 years captive stay okay uh, okay this is How this is my it question in other country no it is only found in india only in india how many numbers now as on today Uh, must be around 500 or 600 including the reintroduced uh, population like every year so far they released 130 individuals and those those individuals also expanded their range so it is believed that around 500 will be there including the wild population in mars Okay. A uh, question from one plus sixty. What is the nesting pattern? Uh, nesting pattern sounds like uh, usually, yeah, they like uh, pattern in what sense? Mm, one plus sixty has to give you that answer. The weird questions. Yeah. How does it defend itself from the predators? Does it have tusk? No, that is maybe one of the reason they like when they are not foraging, they live in they rest inside the nesting pattern nest because this nest is highly camouflaged. They build the nest on the ground with the okay. grasses and mud, so it will be very uh, highly camouflaged. So maybe in the wild they uh, hide inside the nest when they are not uh, and they are uh, like. Uh, they are very sensitive to sound so if there is little sound also they they can easily you know, like they become very alert to the sound okay, okay. like their okay. behavior there are not much studies of the pygmy hawk behavior in the wild because of the habitat type and its elusive nature so not much information whatever behavior i could see that is from the captive breeding center actually Okay. A uh, question from Sudhir. Any populations in, uh, you know, Bhutan that is Royal Man uh, Manas National Park? 
present, but no, there is no direct sighting. Like uh, uh, suitable habitat is there, suitable grassland habitat is there in Royal Manus National Park, but they have not sighted any pygmy hawk. Okay. But they believe it will be there. Because uh, this uh, Royal, Manus, Royal Manus National Park is continuous with uh, Manus National Park. So, could be present. Okay. Any ringing or marking of the ears done to ID them? What is the relationship with the wild boars? Prakash Karu. Like, yeah, they do radio telemetry. Like, they put uh, ear tag to track their movement. But those uh, ear tags, they does not stay for uh, more than one year. Uh, within six months and one year, they get detached from animal. So, that is the only way they attack. And with wild boar, yeah, they like that is the closest uh, sister species of uh, pygmy hawk. Okay. Uh, question from JVD uncle: uh, Do they excavate burrows? Yeah, they they do that also. Like most of the time, in search of uh, insects and other things. Okay, not for nesting. Oh, not finished. Not finished. Okay. Uh, guys, any other question? Yes, I have. Yeah, please. Dipan, with uh, you said uh, about um, the tree. Um, which is the tree? Could you show that picture of the tree, uh, which grows in the area of uh, Manas National Park? That is Bombaxiba. Uh, Bombaxiba. I'm forgot. Yes, I want to cite a plan, um, interesting uh, traditional knowledge about it. Bomba Siba is a foraging species for wild boars. Bef um, because of the flowers, Bomba Siba you know, attracts wild boars. And also, like um, while growing the grass species, you also check the agrostologists. Because um, elephant grass is an endangered species also. Why don't you check the grasses which grow in the Pani Dehing area? Even some ecologists told me this is also there in the area of Pani Dehing, which is a grassland. Have you studied any of the ecological studies if pygmy hogs are there in Pani Dehing area? And also, and final question I would like to just like, are any zoonotic diseases studied on pygmy, 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 pygmy hogs? If I said. No study on genetic species, like genetic disease, there is no study on pygmy hog. Like there are no outbreak. Uh, like recently there was uh, this African uh, swine flu. That prevalent, uh, outbreak of African swine flu is now there in uh, Northeast India. And from 15 uh, or 16,000 wild boar uh, dead already. But uh, so far pygmy hog is not uh, been affected with it. Because 100 years before this is to be in the whole Northeast area, are there any reintroduction studies on pygmy hogs? Yeah, re as I told, reintroduction, all the reintroduction programs are going on in the site where it was earlier present and now, like, uh, it was previously present and now it is locally extinct. That area only they are uh, releasing the pygmy hog, captive pygmy hog. Fine. And related to a uh, previous question, uh, yeah, there are no study on grassland ecology and that uh, Penning Bay area, but uh, uh, there are no record of pygmy hog also in that area. But new records can be there. What I'm saying is like I'm just like, new records of the pygmy hog intrusion into those areas. Because I because why I'm saying this, uh, why I ask this question is I've been to Panideng area and uh, a few grasslands for in Assam and Manas areas for uh, you know, conducting EA studies. So then even the forest, uh, forest officials dropped this name. When I, when I took the, like um, all the gray literature, what all found in all the critically injured, endangered species for EA studies. You got my point? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah, that is a good idea. Like, yeah. Uh, maybe the study should be carried out. Those areas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like this, uh, pygmy or captive breeding center, they have to do, like they are, 
they can actually initiate that study. Yeah, that will be helpful to them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rashikar Garu. Okay, uh, one more question from uh, OnePlus 60. Are they nocturnal? No, they are not nocturnal. Like, they go to nest uh, uh, as early, like 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening, they go to nest. Okay. And they, uh, again, 8 o'clock in the morning, they become active. Okay. okay. Uh, what is the gestation period? Uh, it's about 100 days. 100 days? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. From uh, Prasad Garu, uh, pygmy hogs like elephant grass. For their size, their food choice appears to be elephantine. Question mark. Elephant? Sorry. Elephantine. Yeah, I mean, he meant to say, is it? Isn't it big? No. Elephant grass. They use it for uh, nest building. They mostly okay. uh, consume the rhizome. Tubers of uh, elephant grass. They don't uh, forever. Okay, they don't eat the grass actually. Okay. Uh, grass they use it for uh, building the nest. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more question from Ahmed Rao. Uh, what is your opinion on the pygmy hog louse? Should it be conserved too? Are there any effort from around the world to conserve endangered parasites? Uh, like uh, this. Um, this uh, pygmy hog in the captive breeding center, they don't uh, vaccinate those pygmy hog because uh, they think like if they do so, this pygmy, uh, this hematopinus olivary, this uh, louse also, it may adversely affect. So that is why they don't uh, vaccinate pygmy hog there. And uh, so far, there are no effort to conserve that uh, louse because uh, this pygmy hog itself is very um, sensitive animal. Uh, so they don't uh, usually handle it. They don't capture it. So unless you capture it, you can't uh, get the louse. So that is why they don't. Uh, uh, there are okay. no study so far for its conservation. Okay, and one more question from my side. So you said the lifespan is about seven years. How does it compare to other, uh, like let's say, the wild boar? I didn't get your question. Uh, like what, what is the uh, lifespan of wild boar? Uh. Uh, wild boar also, I think, uh, around 14 years. Yeah, that's what. I, I see a lot of difference there because seven years is like very small. I mean, very oh, it is, wild. Wild. it is in the wild. It is in the wild. In the captive, in the captive breeding center, it is uh, 14 years. Okay. So in the wild, there are so many limiting factors. Resource hmm. will be limiting, then there will be predation. Uh, pressure will be there and some other uh, uh, natural selection will be working, uh, acting on it. So in the wild it is believed that it could be seven years, but there are no records. Okay. okay. Yeah, guys, any more questions? Yeah, I, I think we are through with the questions. Uh, Sireka, please. Okay. Um... Just like I had said in the beginning of this talk, everybody I had asked everybody to grill Deepa and what a volley of questions. I am uh, really, it was fantastic. I mean, so many questions threw up so much uh, curiosity and then we ended up learning with the answers that Deepa gave. Thank you, Deepa, for this fantastic uh, learning experience that you gave us. None of us knew that the pygmy hog, I mean, the rarest and the... It was the world's rarest and the smallest. Now we know so much. Now we are more knowledgeable. So this is really a conversation starter, I think. Thank you, everyone who has attended this uh, webinar, Deepas, and especially on World Environment Day, Deepa took the stage. So we are very happy. And congratulations to all of us on World Environment Day. And uh, our endeavor as a bird society has always been conservation not only of birds, but the entire gamut, nature and its creatures, water bodies and everything. Thank you everyone for attending. See you tomorrow positively at 6 p.m. for Dr. Y.G. Prasad's uh, talk on uh, locusts, locust attack to be precise. Thank you very much for joining. See you tomorrow. That's a promise. Thank yeah, you. Thank 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 you. No problem. Thank you, Gautam. No problem. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks, all. Bye bye.
bye thanks thanks everybody thank you thank you thank you thank, thank you. you everyone there thank you okay